It is my great pleasure to introduce Franz von Holzhausen from Tesla, chief designer at Tesla. And, and Jay Ward from a, a startup uh, animation company, Pixar. Thanks, Terry. Hi, everybody. How are you today? Good, I hope. Um, I'm here today to talk to Franz, and uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing him. We, we were thinking about this. We've actually known each other for over a decade, uh, because back when we were doing Cars, the first Cars film, which came out in 2006, uh, we did a number of trips to the Detroit Auto Show, and uh, met Franz back then. I still have his old business card from a, a, a car company before Tesla. but um, Previous life. Previous life. But we've had the benefit of uh, knowing each other and realizing the amount of crossover between, honestly, car design and animation, it's, it's uncanny, the crossover, and we'll probably talk about that a little bit. Um, we'll just go ahead and jump in for sake of time. I have some questions, which I wrote down. Um, I wanted to start with design influences. Um, you know, when I look at uh, Tesla, there's a very beautiful design language that's clear when you see one coming. You, you know the car when you see it. And my personal question to you is, who are the car designers or the industrial designers that inspired you most when you were growing up or, or even in art school, the ones maybe that even that still inspire you as you work today? Nice to be up here with you, Jed. Yeah. Um, and good well, morning to everybody. Um, I, I think in terms of influences, I, I grew up in the East Coast. My father was an industrial designer, product designer, graphic designer. So I grew up in a household of design. And I think that's ultimately what got me into figuring out my kind of love of cars and that you could actually create them, that, that there's a way you could put both those things together. Um, and so I think I'm, I was always inspired by the fact that you could create products um, and you can make beautiful products by my father. So I, it, my career really started very early on and I was just inundated with it. Um, with design as a child. I, I came out to Los Angeles um, to go to Art Center and I graduated from Art Center. I, I was fortunate enough to spend some time also in the sister campus in Switzerland, which opened my eyes to a lot of European influences and designers. Um, I, I, I did some internships both here in America, also at VW. And really, I think that started honing my design sense in terms of the ideas I got as a, a, a youngster in my dad's you know, studio, um, and then this European practicality and sensibility that came, that, 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 that's still there today. Um, and when I was, you know, when I graduated from Art Center, my first job was at uh, VW and Audi. And I started with some real, pioneers in the industry and some just legends, I think, um, that are mentors, peers, um, and, you know, still major influencers in like Jay Mays, Freeman Thomas, Craig Durfee, some of these guys, you know, I, as a, you know, starting designer in the industry, um, these guys are legends today, but they were also legendary back then. And you can see where their careers have taken them and the influence that they've had in the automotive industry. Um, so working with at VW also opened my eyes to many designers that are still um, influential today. Uh, you look at the, the head of Mercedes, um, you know, people that are uh, at Volvo and Polestar. I worked with uh, head of Audi design. All these guys, um, you know, I worked with, I'm fortunate enough to work with as uh, team mates, team members. And, you know, I think when you're around influential people like that, you can't help but absorb some of that, that mentality, and um, it's always been kind of a framework. I think the, the thing that I learned early on from Jay and Freeman was really this, this purity, the this sense of purity and kind of an absolute um, idea about design and, and kind of stems from Bauhaus and, and those basic principles. And I think they're still prevalent today in the work that, that I, I do and, and some of the, the, the ideas that we, we work on at Tesla, where it's really about um, form and function working well together. You know, I, I kind of have this belief that, that you, know, you can create something beautiful and, and it can be very personal, um, but is it really serving 
us as a as a human race. Um, it may be serving you for you know an outlet for your own personal desires, but if it's not creating a function out of that as well, um, is it really design? You know, so what we what I, I I try to work on and what we what we try to do at Tesla is something that really brings form and function together, um, both as equals partners in that kind of relationship, and um, I think that's what's made our products um, compelling. They're they're beautiful. Um, and that's something that we hold as an incredibly high standard, um, that the beauty is attractive, um, but then as you're attracted to this um, product, you also find the, the incredible functionality in it, and it, and it tends to over-deliver on a sense of functionality. So I think those guys, those kind of early mentors that, you know, they're still in the industry today, those, those have been, you know, major influences. And then I'm always kind of intrigued by what's happening in architecture and fashion design. There's been, you know, I think um, amazing inspiration that comes out of designers like Alexander McQueen or, or Tom Ford even from a, a purity and simplicity. Um, and then also a romantic side of what he was doing with Gucci. I think like Tato Ando does this really stark, you know, extreme architecture, but there's still a function to it. Um, so, you know, influences like that, I think all kind of melds together into, in my brain at least, and it seems to work. Cool. Well, that, that actually leads me to my next question. You've obviously designed some very iconic cars. Uh, you helped with the Volkswagen uh, Beetle concept. Um, and then you went to GM for a while. You actually designed the Pontiac Solstice and the Saturn Sky, which I think are really cool um, roadsters. And finally, the, uh, the Mazda Kabura, which was a really neat concept as well. How did your design process and those philosophies help inform your decisions or guide you as you moved into creating the Model S, the Model X, and now the three and, and these other cars coming like the Roadster? You know, if the sky's the limit, um, you know, what type of vehicle or object do you personally want to design next? Well, I think all, you know, the, the, the stuff you do previously always helps inform you what you're going to do next, um, and either in uh, a lesson on what not to do, or, or maybe taking some of the, the good pieces um, that you've learned and continue to try, uh, apply the principles going forward. And I think you can look at that in life generally. Um, but I, you know, through my career, I've been fortunate enough to be involved with, you know, at, the, at a great time in kind of transitions in, in the industry and at VW when we were working, you know, I was working with Jay and Freeman on the new Beetle. It was really an idea to, to bring back this sense of nostalgia for um, the VW brand. And, you know, at, at that time in the early 90s, you know, VW was in a massive decline in terms of their their product here in North America, and um, really was just looking for a way to kind of rekindle the spirit and the love affair that that people had with the automobile. And the Beetle was, you know, if you you talk to anybody, and I bet in this audience even, there's somebody that, there, well, everybody probably has some story or some memory of an experience they had in a Beetle. Yeah. Whether it's them <laughs> or their family or their parents or something, there's some kind of like moment of, Beetle there in, in all of us. And, you know, that's what, what we were looking at uh, in terms of bringing back that passion and that purity and that fun and um, back to that brand. And I think it, it needed to be done, do, done in a new way, not just a, a re repeat of old styles. And I think what Jay was really driving at was uh, an idea about this kind of Bauhaus minimalism and clean Germanic feeling yeah. um, to the product. And it was successful. And, you know, ironically, when we were first developing that that car was really thought of as a, an electric vehicle, ah. which, you know, maybe is foreshadowing. Um, but then through the years, you know, I think um, when I when I left VW, I had this kind of grandiose idea of, of bringing all this, you know, great design influences um, in purity and simplicity over to GM, which, you know, I don't want to <laughs> step on their toes, but to me, like, it, it just seemed like they were in a design mess at the time. They just didn't really have, um, there was not a, a clean sensibility to their yeah. design palette. And More like I, designed by a committee as opposed yeah, to... Yeah, a little bit vision. of that, and just kind of like all over the place. Like every year, it seemed like the products changed in style over, and just like threw out anything good and started over just because maybe it didn't work or whatever. Yeah. And so it was kind of a confusing time, and there's a lot of brands and a lot of products and a lot of opportunity and I think you know the solstice was really about how do we 
how do we take Pontiac to um, and, and clean it up? You know, get rid of all the the excess that that was there, and just make a pure, fun little roadster. That um, I think what you know Miata at, at the time was just yeah. coming out and was very successful, and it was really kind of looking back at the the Lotus Elan as a pure, simple driving experience, just open air, affordable, fun to drive kind of thing. So. Um, again, a really, uh, de you know, design principle is based on simplicity and and just the allure and fun of driving. Um, and then going to Mazda was interesting because they had this, you know, amazing marketing concept um, in Zoom Zoom, and I think everybody knows the song intrinsically in their head. And but you feel like, what does it mean? What is it, what is it? <laughs> about and, and then you look at the product and it doesn't really relate to this kind of fun, childish behavior um, or, or there's, no, there's no connection between the marketing idea and the design of the, the product. So that's what we tried to do and we were trying to create some design principles that really worked together with the, what everybody already had in their mind as um, what a Mazda should be and I think we were fairly successful in, in yeah. making some changes there. So That's cool. And then my, my last part of that question was, What's the next, you know, vehicle or object even that you'd be interested in designing? Well, you know, at, at Tesla, we're always kind of pushing the boundaries, um, and I think there's a really beautiful convergence of um, the technology and the art of design and the functionality of that. Um, and I think we we've just debuted um, recently uh, a new semi truck, which um, pretty radically changes the the landscape um, in terms of of just cleaning up the environment and really is on mission for what Tesla is trying to do. And you know, just driving through horrendous um, LA traffic this morning, listening to a report on NPR about how, um, you know, in in Los Angeles we have more deaths caused by diesel pollution than any other city in the U.S. And yeah. it's 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 diesel trucks that are really generating that. And so. I think in a in a way we we owe it to ourselves to be creating these products that are enriching our lives and saving lives, not just through things like autopilot and and the future where that's going, but just in clean um, clean energy. Yeah, there's a two part thing there because you have um, you know the autonomy which adds safety or the automatic braking or lane things that's about safety, but then you also have the electric propulsion which is about zero emissions. So it's really a twofold thing. Yeah, it's great. I don't know why anybody wouldn't want. Any of the, our products. Oh. <laughs> um, so when you come to a company like Tesla, you know you, you come from big car companies, Volkswagen or, or Mazda, or GM, the big, uh, and then you start with a fresh, clean sheet of paper. And you've been at Tesla really from the ground floor. You know, in, in my opinion, from the very early days of it, uh, you're setting a new design language for a new car company. That's a that's a big deal. Is it liberating or is it daunting? It's, it's kind of both, I think, as a designer um, and as a student. You know, the, the, the thing that you, you dream of is having this clean sheet of paper and just doing whatever you want to do. And, and in a way, coming to Tesla, that's exactly what we had. Um, we wanted to create, um, we, we had Roadster, which we, when I joined in 2008 was not yet on the road. Um, and we had this, you know, Elon and I had this idea of, of internally designing and engineering our own products, not working with a partner. Um, and because we saw that the, the combination of the electric architecture and a vehicle just couldn't, you couldn't just plug it into a vehicle and make it successful. Um, they need to inherently work together. So we said we need to create a sedan, but we have no history, no legacy, doesn't, you know, where do we start? And so it was really a, a clean sheet of paper. And in a way, I think maybe as a writer or um, any, any other kind of creative industry, especially I think in writing, when you start with that blank sheet of paper and you're looking at it like, okay, where do I start? That's that's pretty hard, um, especially when kind of the you're you're bearing the, the brunt of the product is really the foundation for the the company going forward. So we had to be successful with it. Um, so there was no pressure on that. I think you know what we what I basically started looking at is how do we combine this idea of functionality, the, the, what an electric uh, powertrain affords us. And we were pretty innovative um, 10 years ago when we were looking at that architecture and with the battery on the floor and the, the, 
the motor between the wheels and the rest I always called the, the opportunity space, um, what we could give back to the customer. And then as a new brand, you know, we're, we're basically competing with the Audis and Mercedes and BMWs of the world, which, you know, have 100 years of engineering, 100 years of, you know, your parents and your parents' parents purchasing them and they're in your brain and you just kind of know the inherent values of the product and um, they're, they're marketed like crazy everywhere and, and we had to go up against that and so we tried to create a design that was just beautiful and alluring and in a way like the, a moth attracted to a flame yeah. that you look at it and you're just drawn to it and you have to learn more about it even if you don't know anything about the, the, the brand. The, the Model S came out in 2012 yeah, and <clears throat> I thought, all right, this has come out. This is a beautiful car. It's striking. The technology was really a moonshot. A lot of things about it. Like you said, the battery's low in the floor. The motor's at the wheels. Huge space inside. A lot of greenhouse. Beautiful. <clears throat> and I thought, wow, the, the other manufacturers are going to just, within a year or two years, and yet here we are. It's six years later, and we still have very few companies that are offering a compelling, um, really, something to, to go up against Tesla, which I, I find fascinating that they're all kind of still catching up. I mean, even we've seen diesel go from this clean TDI thing to just, that, that's not even talked about anymore. And now they're much more catching up into a pure electric drivetrain. I just, it, it's amazing to me that it took this many years. Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, it still feels like it's, they're, they're lagging. Um, and, I, you know, part of me wonder, wonders if they're just, you know, so ingrained in the technology that they know and the investment that they put into their, their production and, and their intellectual property and internal combustion engines that that's where they want to spend their money and they already have a, a um, what they think is, you know, compelling enough product. Um, and I think in a way it took us to be an, an all-in, 100% electric um, car company or just energy company um, to, to, realize, to, to, to be able to break out of the mold and not be encumbered or um, caught up in trying to kind of be the best of both worlds or a hybrid yeah. or something like that. A true and, disruptor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think it's really, you know, it's the Tesla mission is really about, you know, making a better environment and making a better world for all of us and doing, you know, with, with clean energy. And even a hybrid isn't quite getting you there. Um, and, it, and, and hybrid is kind of the best, it's not quite the best of everything. It's, it's good kind of on a lot of levels, but not great. And we wanted, we, we realized as a company, we need to be great. Cool. Um, so, you know, with the electric powertrain, obviously you're, 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 you're not needing a grill, you're not needing certain air intakes, you're not needing a lot of things because an automobile with a petrol engine has so many systems in it. How did that play into the design as well? Because obviously your, your shape can be smooth. I even noticed that you went from having sort of a grill indication to no indication now on the, on the refresh for the Model S. Like how, how do you guys think about that? Because like you said, the liberation of the batteries down low helps inform interior design, but, but how, what other ways does it inform design when you have pure electric? Yeah, I think, you know, the architecture of pure electric really allows for some freedom um, in, the, in the development of the vehicle. And like you said, I think what, you know, what in our principles and what, what I think is effective is the idea of, of merging form and function and not having decorative stuff. Um, and I think we learned early on that the, the nose cone on the original Model S is a bit decorative. There is some function to it, but it was you know, a little bit more decorative. And... Uh, as soon as we could, we went and, and took it away because we didn't need it. Um, and I think the car actually got better and improved and feels more modern. And, you know, for a car that 10 years, we started designing 10 years ago, um, and you look at it on the road today, and I think there's still a freshness and a purity and a, and a, and a modernity to that vehicle that um, has, you know, there's a bit of a timelessness in there. And I, and I think a lot of that is just about not having excess. Um, and things like nose cones and extra badging and extra stuff on the on the car, we just decided you don't need it. We shouldn't be fastidial in any way. We shouldn't harken back to uh, internal combustion in any way. We should just be moving forward. But in a way that's attractive and that's not garish or is makes somebody queasy or uncomfortable. I think there's something about like an early adopter crowd that'll kind of jump onto really new, innovative couture ideas. Um, but from a mass market perspective, we're dealing with a pretty broad sensibility. And I think the last thing that we want to do or that I want to do is have somebody feel not confident or uncomfortable as they're driving the car around. It's too much car for them. It wears mm -hmm. them or, you know, however you, 
you know, it's the difference between like the couture runway fashion stuff versus what you actually purchase and wear around every day. <laughs> um, and we want to make a, a product that people feel great in. I think it still exudes luxury though. Like it still looks like a premium car, which it is, you know, it's a, it's a premium price car obviously. And it, and it, and it feels premium in the quality and the, and there's a bespoke nature to it. And yet you're right. There is a simplicity. Yeah. I mean, you can even just walk around in this, you know, beautiful museum and you see um, kind of proportions and language and things that just are, you know, inspiring and, and, and you kind of, you're not sure why you're attracted to them, but I think the, you know, I always think that good proportions is the starting point for good design and you look around and you just see great proportions everywhere and it tends to be kind of low and wide and, um, you know, clean and beautiful lines and, you know, those are just little cues that we try to employ into all of our products. Yeah. And, you, and, and people want their car to say something about them. They want to make a statement with their car often. Some people don't care at all. But for me, I, I, my car says something about me. And, you know, when you think about that as Tesla, you, you have people that are buying a car because they believe in the mission of zero emissions, of the efficiency of the car. But there's also people that, that feel there's a certain identity to the car that they want to identify with as well beyond that. I see almost every Model S has personalized plates. Every single one. Nobody puts just a standard, cal they've all got a personalized plate. Why is that? I think people really believe in it, and, and I think they have the ability now to um, get into a product that um, they don't have to f uh, feel ashamed about mm. or feel like they've buried their soul somewhere in the desert just to, <laughs> to you know, to be green and efficient. Um, and I think they can feel attractive in it, and I think that was our goal: is to to make it a product that you you are attracted to, whether you're on mission or not. Um, but if you are on mission, you you feel great about it. And I don't think there was a product that was really delivering on that any of those principles in the in the past until we came along. Yeah. Uh, one last question for you. Um, so, what are you personally most excited about that's coming in the near future of the automobile? I'm sure you've got that question a lot. Is there some new technology or changes even you see in the automotive industry or even automotive culture that you see coming that excites you personally? Well, I think, you know, I feel like we're on the precipice of where transportation is headed anyways. I think what's been, you know, the past 10, 15, 20 years has been really exciting just to see um, the broad range of attempts to, you know, still captivate an, an exciting an excitement in the product in terms of what um, manufacturing principles are out there that have, you know, allowed us to mass produce products um, that have a story and have um, a unique character from a brand perspective. If you look at like the 70s and 80s, you kind of got this homogenous kind of bland feel, and I think it was just a lack of technology that was allowing us the to The Dodge Aries K yeah. car? Come on, that's a beaut. <laughs> Sorry, Dodge go ahead. engineering. Um, <laughs> And so I think that's that's one element, and I think the next thing is just that, that technology in terms of um, where autonomy is headed, um, and I think that's you know big topic right now, and I think that's really going to shake up how we deal with transportation going forward, personal transportation, um, getting around safely, and I think you know autonomy is really I think that the roots of it are really about making a safer environment for all of us to get from from one place to the next um, and do it in kind of a character and a style that, that we want um, and that we're, we're buying into. Um, I don't think, you know, there's, there's a lot of, just I think there's, there's tons of opinions about where autonomy could go or where it may be headed and a lot of them tend to be, you know, that it's gonna be bland and, and emotionless and, um, you know, we're gonna be like cattle in, in a car, you know, in these, rail cars, but I think um, there's, it's a real, I, I see it as a real opportunity to continue to provide <clears throat> style and character, um, but in a way where, you know, like, uh, how did everybody get here today? Did they, ha did they really love and the drive that they had to do to get through LA traffic to get here? Um, I certainly didn't, and if I had, you know, my own chauffeur that could take me here, that would be great, but uh, autonomy is gonna allow you to get from A to B in in style, with in you know relaxed and comfort, knowing that you're safer than any other type of transportation, and I think that's an exciting future, and that's a future I want my kids to grow up in. Um, I think there's always going to be a place and a space for actual driving, so and we'll, we'll never lose that. You know, I think 
I feel like there's humans have always had this kind of quest for speed and kind of how do we go faster and how do we like there's an excitement and a lure about that and you just see it through generations um, and we'll, I don't think we'll ever lose that there will always be an outlet for that um, and we'll be there creating that um, that outlet so I think you know in a way the next gen roadster that we just debuted alongside the semi really shows how exciting that future can be um, because you're starting to get to the limit of physics on being able to accelerate and, and move yourself around, which is, it's pretty unreal. <clears throat> Speaking of the Roadster, the one that's up in space right now, is that is that going to come back down at some point? Do we know? Not that I know of, unless somebody <laughs> can figure out how to go get it. But and if so, those stories too. yeah, can it, be, can, can it be used again? Can we possibly drive that car someday? Or would it end up in the Tesla Museum? I think if, it could, if somebody got it back, it could definitely be used. <laughs> Yeah. Did you put any personal artifacts in the car? I did personally not, no. Okay. <laughs> I had to ask that. Um, that's all the questions that I, I had for you for the moment. Um, cool. I actually have some questions for you. Uh, that's, yeah. Looks like we have a little bit of time. Okay. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> Pixar, Cars, you're kind of the, the legend behind Cars and, and all that. Um, and congrats on Cars 3, I think. Um, pretty awesome. My kids love it. Um, is there a Cars 4, 5, 6? <laughs> is this like the Fast and Furious chain of animation? Uh, yeah, I, you know, I don't know. We, we, our goal is always to tell great stories. Um, and you know, our primary function at Pixar is just to tell great stories. And those stories can come from anywhere. Um, we had a film called Coco that came out this year that was supposed to be a very small boutique film. And it, it turned out to be a massive film globally that just, res, just really uh, you know, responded with audiences in, in China and Europe and everywhere. So you never know where these stories are gonna come from. Cars kind of has a life of its own. And I think you know, what I'm excited about as the technology is changing with cars, the changing technology we have for film is people are viewing films now on their phone, on their iPad. They don't wanna wait for something to come in the theater. And so you see episodic content um, is becoming really a big thing now. People are enjoying that. And so I'm excited about some episodic things we can do with McQueen, which I'm kind of uh, thinking about some fun ideas for that. Yeah, that was my next question. Like, what happens to Lightning McQueen? Does he just <laughs> stay who he is, or does he transform into the future? <clears throat> you know, it's funny. New technologies come along. It, it, it's funny because, our, you know, our, in the world of cars, they are characters first that happen to be cars. And I remember we were working on uh, one of the Cars films and Porsche came to us and they said, can you guys update Sally to a, to a 991? And I was like, no, 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 Sally's a, she is what she, you can't change the face, it wouldn't be Sally anymore. And they, in this German kind of way, went, oh, okay, they didn't quite understand. Um, so no, we can't change McQueen, he is who he is. And it's funny, when, when you're done with a film and you release that into the world, the world owns that film now. You don't own it anymore. It becomes part of them. And when you see a child with a backpack or a little boy playing with the Lightning McQueen or, you know, um, it, you realize you've released something. It belongs to them now. And you, you have to manage that. And that's part of my job is to make sure that we responsibly keep that alive for them in a way that's meaningful to them, like Cars Land, which we opened at uh, California Adventure. Um, and... It's funny to me, I went to Monaco for the, for the Grand Prix when we were doing research for Cars 2, and I was walking down the aisle and they had Ferrari and Mercedes and McLaren, all this cool stuff, and there was a vendor selling these knockoff Lightning McQueen stuff for the kids, and I was like, that's awesome, we're at Formula One! And you know, I thought, why aren't we doing that? Um, and I, and it, it's cool to me because culturally, it's become a part of the, of the culture, which is cool to me. And, and I think also that we have little children now that care about cars, which you and I love, that otherwise might have not cared about cars. So that to me is special too. Yeah, I agree. My, um, my kids, you know, they don't really care what I do, but they're really attracted <laughs> to what you do. Uh, so will Lightning race a Roadster in the future? Can you, can you, can you work that in? <laughs> put, put, a, put a Tesla in the film. Uh, people don't really give us credit for this, but we were actually the first ones to feature autonomous vehicles. So cars, there's no humans. Think about this. They drive themselves, people. We were first. So, <laughs> uh, and people have said, why don't you do an electric car in the movie? But that would just be a character that's silent, that just kind of comes up behind you and scares you, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, you, you're known for cars, and you mentioned Coco. Like, what else inspires you beyond the car stuff? Well, I'm surrounded by great filmmakers, and, and the first film I worked on was Monsters, Inc. Uh, I worked on Ratatouille, a lot of great films with a lot of amazing people. And, and 
we're, we're not cartoon people, we're filmmakers and we're storytellers. And I think Tesla, you guys are storytellers. Like a great car company is a storyteller. Um, and I'm just inspired by great stories. So I love live action as much as I love animation. Um, and what's exciting to me is the, the outlet people have to tell stories now. The fact that my kids and your kids can pick up an iPad and make a film, a compelling film, with the tools that you and I just didn't have. You know, I would do the drawing on the little pad of paper and flip through it into a flip book, and that was a big deal. But now our kids can truly make, edit, and put out into the world via YouTube or something else their movies. And that's phenomenal to me. That's great to me. In, in character creation, what's the, what, what challenges you the most? Everything for us goes back to story. And, and a great character is a, is a character that you can relate to in some way. Whether it's a good guy or a bad guy or, or whoever, you want to relate to that character, to care if they live or die. And there's plenty of amazing films out there that cost a lot of money to make and they look spectacular on the screen, but you don't really care that much. And when you're done, there's plenty of movies where you say, I don't need to see that again. And our goal is to, in designing a character for a movie to say, I want to see that film again, or I could watch a Pixar film over and over again. That means that we've succeeded. Yeah. You know, I think in, in our industry, in your industry as well, um, a lot of credit goes to kind of individuals and, um, you know, it's, it, there's always a team that's behind people like us. Um, and, you know, I think we're fortunate to have worked on great teams and then gotten to where we are. Because of that, like, how do you, how do you find talent? Like, how do you find people that think like you do? It's a good question because Pixar gets, as you can imagine, a lot of resumes. Um, when I started there, it was before Pixar was a household name. And I worked there because I believed in what the studio was doing. You know, when you started at Tesla, Tesla was not a household name. And so you saw something there, right? You believed in what these people were doing and you wanted to be part of it. And that's how I felt when I came to Pixar. Now we have people, oh, I just want to work at Pixar. I would sweep the floors. I, we don't need somebody to sweep the floors. I want somebody who says, I've spent my whole life studying this and my dream is to be this. That's who I want, is the person that has a focus and a goal and their passion is to do this thing that they're great at and I want that person, right? So that's... So how, how hard is it to become a member of your team? It, you know, there's the, the two questions you get is, can I have a tour and can I have a job? And uh, both of those are, are harder than they sound. Um, and, and I think for us, it's finding people that we want to work with. <clears throat> there's plenty of very talented people that are not fun to work with. And there's plenty of egos in the world of automobile design as well as you know, film and animation, plenty of egos. And people who are too much of an individualist tend to not work out well at our studio. We're pretty egalitarian. We're 350 miles away from Hollywood, both in mileage and also in ideology, in that we don't treat uh, certain people in our studio better than other people. And I think that's something special about us that we really try to maintain that culture. How many... Um car fanatics do you have on your team? Or is it just you? Are you the, like the, the car leader? We have a lot of gearheads. Bob Polly, the guy who designed Lightning McQueen, is a huge car guy. He has a Volvo P1800. Um, Jay Schuster, the guy who designed Wally the robot, his dad worked at GM for 40 years, and he has an old Airstream. We have a lot of car people. And I started realizing how many car people there were hiding in our studio, and I put together a car show at Pixar called the Motorama, which is an employee-only event, not open to the public, where we invite the employees to bring their cars and display them in classic cars. We have the manufacturers, including Tesla, bring one-offs concepts. The only rule is it can't be a car that I could go to the showroom and see. It has to be something special. We get classics from the Peterson. And it, it gives people at the studio who aren't car people a chance to see the car as art, to see the car as an expression. Um, there's lots of people that love Teslas at, my, at our work and that love green technology. And there's even a section for those cars as well. But I think the automobile love and this cultural thing we have with cars, it, it definitely parlays into filmmaking as well. That's cool. Maybe that show should be hosted here. Yeah, we could in do a small outside, Pixar right? Motorama here. Yeah, be cool. That'd be fun. Um, I, I've heard that you're, you have a dream project um, in a Bonneville salt flat racer. How are you doing on that? Uh, I, 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 I've gone to Bonneville a number of times, and if you haven't been and, and you have any love at all, I please put it on your bucket list to go to Bonneville. The other reason is that the salt is actually going away right now. And there's a chance that people will not be able to race there in 10 or 15 years. Um, so go if you can. And, and, and my dream is just always to be part of a team, to see that happen and, and to uh, someday like to race a motorcycle on the, on the salt is what I'd like to do just because it's the craziest thing you can imagine. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. Yeah. But um, going to Bonneville, what's special about it to me is that there's a team camaraderie. There's, there's a, again, this selfless thing of you help everybody out that's not, I'm going to beat this guy. I'm going to beat the time, the clock. And I love that about Bonneville. So uh, I, I think that's my goal is just to keep going back and being part of it. 
what about the car? You're going to build a car, right? <laughs> I'm hoping other friends build some Bonneville Got it. cars. Oh, yeah, smart. yeah, yeah. Not building my own. I hope other people spend all their money at Bonneville. Cool. Yeah. So we have enough time left for some Q&A, which I'm sure you guys have some questions for Franz, which would be great. There's one right here in front. Do we probably need a microphone? Somebody's coming, so hold on one second. Yeah, keep the hand up until they can find you. I'd like to ask, can you, hello? Uh, I'd like to ask you a question about um, the original, a long time had a, a concept of changing the battery in the Tesla. And um, when the S came out, I remember that um, Musk mentioned you could change the battery quicker than fill a car with gas. Now, are you still pursuing the idea of battery changing and will that reduce the price of the car? You know, in the original uh, Model S, we, we had the idea to make um, a battery pack swap uh, an idea and we actually demonstrated that you could do it faster than, you could actually do a pack swap faster than, than filling up a equal car um, with gas. And so we actually, you know, beta tested that essentially out in the public and we found that um, with our supercharging network that that was that was what people actually were more attracted to so i think what we learned was pack swap was not um, a desirable as desirable as we thought maybe it would be and we we realized the supercharging network um, was much more compelling and that's the direction that we're we're headed in the future I think you're also seeing more range than you had 10 yeah, years ago. exactly. The range in our products now is over 300 miles um, for, for ne nearly all of them. And I think, you know, at 300 miles range, it's pretty tough to go um, 300 miles without stopping, you know, for break or restroom <laughs> or whatever. So um, I challenge you to do that. <laughs> um, so, and I think that's, that's you know, it was a, a, an interesting idea at the time, and we, you know, we learned from feedback from the public um, what our course should be. Back cool. Here, to your right. So I'm a huge admirer of you both, and I know that you're both true car enthusiasts. And I'm looking at the future of the automobile right behind you, and I can't think of two people I'd rather ask this question to. What about the future of the? collectible automobile, the old automobile, the museum, and, and what do you see that in the future? Is there a place for that? So you're saying cars that will become collectibles in the future? Yeah, and also what the cars that are around this room that are, you know, so highly desired now, what, what, what's the future of that? Mm. That's a tough question. Um, you know, every year when I go up to, to Monterey and, and see the amazing vehicles that are out on the lawn or out on the track driving around and the history behind that and realizing that it's you know, barely 100 years of, of history, um, I, I'm, I, and I'm always intrigued by what like, new stuff comes out of the woodwork um, and things that I've never heard of or never knew existed appear and barn finds and all those things. And I think that's just going to continue for quite a long time. Uh, I think, um, you know, in a, in a way, and this is my personal opinion, I think it's almost a shame that cars sit in museums like this, especially cars that were really designed to be driven and to be used. Um, and it would be cool to figure out a, a museum where you, the, the, the cars are actually used all the time the way they're intended to. Um, so we can work on that together. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, even cars of today, you know, as, as the, the industry changes and as, um, you know, our worlds change, there's always going to be a look back on what got us to where we were and, and history will always play a part in that. And I think there's the potential for the products and things that, you know, like you're working on, the things that we're working on will be you know, 25, 30, 50 years, 100 years now in museums because they were part of a change and part of a, a difference that really hopefully made our lives a lot better. Um, and that, that should always be recorded. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but... I, I would agree that it's, it's great to see a car for the pure aesthetics and the beauty of it in a museum, but there's something more exciting about the visceral feeling of being 
in a car, in an old car, going around a racetrack with the back end losing traction and the smell of oil and gas. And um, there's something romantic about it. And maybe it is a bygone era, but it's it's something beautiful that does transport you. And I, uh, you know, Bruce and I both went to Lufke Kult uh, last weekend. And I think what makes that show so successful is that the car is seen as art in a curated, beautiful way, but they're all driven there and they're all driven out at the end. And it's not uncommon for somebody to start something up and lay the throttle open and crowds gather around. and. It's, it's, it's showing the car accessible and I think in a different way. And I think that will continue to happen as well is that the, that, that curation will, will continue to change too. Like you said, driving them instead of just sitting. I, I think there's, there's something compelling there. Yeah, I mean, it's almost a shame to like not be able to get in the car and... and there's you know, a 250 GTO over yeah, there. If we like, could just pop the door open and... We should be able to drive that. Chip right? wouldn't mind. I, don't, I, don't, I think Chip <laughs> wouldn't have a problem. Let's just do that. Oh, sorry. Okay. Thank you very much for coming to speak to us. And as a Tesla Model 3 owner, we are just more thrilled about a car than I've ever been in the past. But what I wanted to ask you about is having, tes having Tesla's design studio, I think down here in Hawthorne, co-sharing space with SpaceX. How has it been being in a rocket factory? How has that influenced or informed your design ideas? And how has it been just living in that space? Yeah. Um Tesla design is here in Hawthorne. We're actually not inside of SpaceX, but but we did start, Model S was designed in a tent in the corner of SpaceX. Um, and the tent was probably no bigger than this stage. So if you think of kind of humble beginnings, um, Model S really was <laughs> the epitome of that. Um, we, you know, both, both brands have grown um, in their needs and what they're accomplishing uh, and so space is becoming more of a premium so we have our own studio that's next to SpaceX um, you know I think for me it was fascinating spending a few years inside of SpaceX and, and seeing just the technology and um, the drive and the passion um, to succeed and to, to really make a difference and uh, that just the engineering mindset behind that and you know I I really love figuring out how to combine amazing engineering into a beautiful aesthetic. And I think that, to me, is really what design is about. Um, and, and hopefully that has transpired um, in our vehicles. Um, you know, I think they're, they're, they're separate companies, and we treat them um, with that kind of respect. So, uh, you know, there's, there's kind of mental influence. Um, but... I think anybody that owns a Model S can, you know, realize that it, it, it started from humble beginnings inside of SpaceX, and it was a really fascinating time. Yeah. Thank you both so much for sharing your design with us. I have a question for Franz about, sorry, I have a question for Franz about um, the shift that you had to make to have the interior of the Model 3 be so clean relative to any car we've seen before? And in particular, what challenges did you have in terms of making that shift in interior design? Yeah, thanks. Uh, Model 3, if, if you haven't seen it, has a pretty revolutionary interior design. It's really focused on and based on uh, an idea of minimalism and, and uh, the idea that less is more. Um, we've always had this principle that the the, the screen of the car is the, the main interaction space that you deal with when you're in there and that the rest of the interior should really support that. Um, and if you think of that on a very puristic level, what are the other things that you actually need in the car? So Model 3 is a single screen in the center, uh, accessible for, for if we were sitting in the car for both of us. Um, and it really delivers all the information that you need, plus the portal for you to interact back to the car. And Everything else is kind of takes second back seat. So we 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 realized that you know extra buttons, extra switches were just excess and not necessarily needed. And kind of this pure absolute thinking that I was trying to describe before. Um, and I think in a way we just you know the we believed in that that principle and were able to create I think a, a beautiful uh, minimalist experience that allows, you know, I think it also has a little bit of a hint of looking forward in the idea of autonomy where you don't need all these extra screens, you don't need all these other elements um, if the car is actually doing the work for you. So we want to make a calm, serene space that was really um, more about 
um, just being relaxed in the space, not overbearing and overburdening you with too much information. Um, and one that, that I think allows the, the actual interface on the screen to grow over time. And that's one of the beauties of our vehicles is the over-the-air updates that allow the product, the car, to get better with time. And, you know, I think, you know, arguably looking, you know, in the museum, you could say a lot of these cars get better with time, but actually the cars that you drive every day, these, you know, the Tesla products, they, they age um, kind of into the future in a way they, that, that we're always updating them and updating the drive experience, the user experience, and the car just, there's no other car that really does that, that gets better with age. So uh, Model 3 is kind of a, a, a platform that allows it to improve with age um, and improve into the autonomous kind of movement as the technology and the regulations <clears throat> allow for better and safer autonomy. Uh, thank you for addressing the minimalist approach for uh, design. Uh, but we are physical human beings and we like touching things. So how did you make this choice and uh, any plan to add some haptic feedback? You know, the issues related to touch screens, uh, you remove your gaze out of the road. Are you planning to add some haptic feedback in the future? Thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. We've definitely explored the haptic response. I think um, anybody that washes their car still gets kind of a haptic um, feedback on the form language that we put into the exterior of the car. I think the interior is it's it's not stark by any means. Um, it's definitely comfortable, and there's you know we use premium materials. Um, I think you know it's worth noting that in, in the Model Three there's there's no cows killed, there's no leather in our cars, um, and I think you know that's a step towards sustainability and a and a and a better future as well. Um, and you know there's there's a sensibility in the the pieces that are there, and there's a a haptic sense to it, and in, in reference to the to the screen, the haptic response is different when you're it's a fit, fixed object versus something that's in your hand. So in a phone, you, you're kind of holding it in, and you get the the response. But on the screen, kind of everything tends to want to move um, when you have provide some sort of haptic feedback. So we found that the the interaction, um, visual interaction, is um, works really well. And we don't. We, we realized we didn't need the excessive haptic component to it. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate Thank it. Thank, Thank you. you.